Finance with Manisha Natarajan. From millennium to maximum to the IT capital, three shining beacons of India's urbanization story were brutally exposed with just above average rains hitting these cities. In fact, this monsoon season has brought the focus back squarely on our inability to manage our cities. So once again, we are harping on the same old, same old, India's urban mess. But can we stop doing it? Well, not at all. Not until something changes and changes for the better. Welcome everyone to the Realty Debate on India's urban governance and all that's missing. Plus, how can it be fixed? We have with us J.C. Sharma, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Shobha Limited. Amit Bhatt, Director, Integrated Transport, Sustainable Cities, WRI India. Ravindra Punde, Architect and Urban Planner and Founder, Partner, Design Cell. Also, Director, School of Environment and Architecture, SEA. And Shailesh Pathak, Executive Director, Bharatiya Group. Also a very prolific writer. Let's break down the discussion, gentlemen, into three parts. Why is there such a lack of urban planning in India? Who's responsible for our city's well-being? And what will it take to fix the urban mess? But before that, I just wanted to put in perspective why there's a red alert on our cities. Now look at the monsoon madness. We spoke about it, but three of our country's biggest and brightest metropolitans, Gurgaon, Mumbai and Bangalore, were under deluge. And the story is the same every year. We didn't learn anything from Chennai, which happened in just November last year. It doesn't end there. Look at the filthy air. It's no breaking news that half of the world's 20 most polluted cities are in India or that our capital is the most polluted city on the globe. Nobody cares, and it's just not an urgent solution or problem to actually find a solution to. Sprawling slums, mismanaged cities are also reflected in the shocking fact that nearly 65.5 million or 6.5 crore live in urban slums. Bollywood City, of course, beats them all, and we know that. Stinking cities. The Swachh Bharat mission was launched with much fanfare in 2014 to make Indian cities clean and open. Some progress has been made. We'll accept, and we are very happy to acknowledge that progress. But we are far, far from reaching anywhere close to even what you would call average sanitation. So, gentlemen, we are back to finding the solution. Amit, let me start with you because you have written extensively about this subject. And if I were to just come to my first point, why is there such a lack of urban planning? Forget about older cities. Even as we are growing into the suburbs, there's zero planning. No, exactly. And that, that is a very fundamental question. So, I mean, we have to understand how cities are governed right now. So cities are still not governed at city level. They are largely governed at state level. And therefore, when the state governs a city, a context is lost. The whole ideology of how you plan cities, how you plan for it is lost. So there are issues around governance. So that's fundamental. I mean, if you look at some of these big cities which have transformed, the Seoul's of the world or the Bogotas of the world or the New York's of the world, they have transformed because of a leadership mm -hmm. which took care of the city planning. Right. So that's number one. So there is governance issue. Second about is the whole issue of urban planning. The, the concept which unfortunately is still prevailing right now is that we plan for houses and we think the city is done. But we know that cities are beyond houses and housing. So who plans for transport? Right now if you look at any trans master plan of the city, the transport plan never talks to the urban planning. The urban planning never talks to resilience. And the resilience never talks to disaster planning. I mean look at Gurgaon, right? Most of the roads you will see don't have drains. And it's a fundamental, it's an elemental question that drains and uh, have to go hand in hand with, with road network. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you are gone, right? Second, how do you, how do you plan f taking into account the existing natural resource? So the way most of the urban planners, and I am a planner myself, is that we think that s cities are flat terrain. So whatever lakes are there, whatever natural water features are there, whatever natural topography is there, we just flatten it out, oh. we build the city, one rain, and then we are stuck. So I, to me, there are three fundamental questions. One is the issue about governance. Mm -hmm. Second is the issue about capacity. And third is the issue about knowledge, skill set, or willpower to make the change happen. Wow, okay. I think you really, really started the discussion on, on a very, very comprehensive and cohesive note. 
I'm going to go to Mr. J.C. Sharma. I think the point that uh, Amit Bhatt mentioned that, you know, we plan for houses, we plan for development, but we really do not link it to everything which is required around that to make that area livable. Mr. Sharma, would you agree with that? Definitely. We are seeing it and we need to agree with whatever Amit had just said. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would also like to calibrate it. You see, we are not talking about Kolkata, where, uh, right, you will see now better road, better planning, better implementation, better, better infrastructure in total kind of a thing. So it is possible also. And let me go one step further. I may not be well uh, conversant with how the Gurgaon is being planned, but as far as Bangalore is concerned, what would it be to we have the insight, all the experts, including the experts from the outside country, they come, they meet, all these shareholders or the stakeholders, they have decided that plan. What we personally believe is the implementation of that plan somewhere is lacking. And unfortunately, the city which gives so much of income to the country, it is always underinvested. Hmm. So the city is not considered as a vote bank. All the plans, all the things today, whatever we are hearing about, it is concerning the other people, as if the cities have the only right to earn and uh, give the money. It is like somewhere the NRIs ah. who work outside and remitting money and not being taken care of. We feel sometimes like that in our own country, where the authorities, they do not consider us as the real stakeholders. So you're not the real stakeholder or the first citizens. Your first citizens when it comes to paying taxes and contributing to the kitty. And I think Amit Bhatt also pointed out that the decision is being taken right. by someone who doesn't have a stake in the city, doesn't get his votes from the city. Shalish Pata come in here. How true is that? I mean, really we've moved on to the second part of our discussion. Who governs the city? I mean, it's chief ministers trading blame? Who, who governs the city? So Edward Glasser of uh, Harvard University has written a book called Triumph of the City. Mm -hmm. And he says exactly the same thing. He says the problem with Indian cities, unlike global cities, is that they have zero ownership or zero capability to drive themselves forward because the state capitals and the chief ministers uh, rule them. So in a, in a sense, if cities are the growth engines of India, the state governments are the biggest bricks. Mm. And just to repeat the three things that yeah. Amit said, governance, capability, I'll, I'll add a couple. So governance in Gurgaon, since uh, Mr. Sharma mentioned, Mr. Sharma, I'm happy to tell you that the Gurgaon Municipal Corporation was elected in 2011 and was supposed to be re-elected in 2016. And the government of Haryana has delayed it because it wants to do delimitation of 35 wards into 32. And because the Municipal Corporation is not there, now there is talk about a Gurgaon Development Authority, which will be driven by oh, Chandigarh. Absolutely new bureaucrats coming in, so, lots of chai nashta happening, still so, no work. So point number I one. Agree. Uh, I do agree. The so, Chandigarh people do not understand Gurgaon problems. No, actually Chandigarh is a very well administered city. It is. It is about. It's the highest. In, in, in the Urban Development Ministry report, it's the top city of India yes. with 75 points. And the reason for that is all decisions relating to Chandigarh are taken in Chandigarh. They are not taken in Delhi. And all decisions in Gurgaon are taken in Chandigarh. So it's a bit of a dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. That's number one, the state government. The, uh, the second point is actually, I work with many municipal corporations in the country. And the level of capability and capacity is really not very high. Mm -hmm. Not very high. And of course... The third is, have you heard of many two-time mayors in India? No, mm. because there is this provision of rotation. SC, ST, OBC, general, again SC, ST, OBC. So Calcutta, Kolkata does not have this rotation, which is why you've heard of a two-time mayor in Kolkata mm. who took ownership and improved Kolkata. The good news, before I... The good news is that I understand that the government of India is seized of this and they are very soon, within the next six weeks, calling a large-scale national conference on urban renaissance. Mm -hmm. in which they are talking about five pillars to improve Indian cities. Empowerment of the mayor is one of them. Capability building is the other. Integrated transport planning and all other things that go into the mishmash of urban management is the... The last point I want to say, 60-70% of Indian cities are yet to be built. Yeah, absolutely. If we, if we do not get our stormwater drainage right, we are going to see this 
flooding because of rains on an annual basis. Okay, so it's not going to be a one off instance. Yes. Wow, I think that's an excellent summary, but we still have a lot more to talk about. Mr. Pundey, I'm going to come to you. If you, as an architect, it must be very frustrating uh, going back to the planning bit and the haphazard growth. The solutions are for everyone to see, yet they're not happening. So basically, I, <clears throat> I have a slightly different take being a person from, you know, a design field. Uh, one of the most important things that happens in most of our most of our city planning exercises is that they're essentially done through a system of revenue records. So that's the base data with which we work. There's hardly any documentation of the terrain. And if you don't understand the terrain, you're not going to be able to resolve this problem of this city. Be it any city. For example, I can give you, because I have studied these towns to some extent, and uh, I can tell you that... Uh, Gurgaon, actually you have Aravlis on, on one edge, the end tail of the uh, hills, and that kind of drains down into the Nazavgad drain. And you know that that city at one time, uh, that location at one time, had a 300 square kilometer Nazavgad jheel, mm -hmm. which was like a sponge that kind of absorbed the rainwater or the overflow from the Yamuna would kind of come back, backflow into this jheel. So there is an overall natural system Right. That exists. And I think our cities, when we build them, we really don't look at these natural systems. Take, for example, Bangalore. Bangalore is a great place which is a complete regime and hierarchy of tanks. And there is a very well-developed, historically a very well-developed regime of water overflows. We've kind of completely ignored these physical realities of our environment. And our planning does not account for these things. We do not understand in depth the ground on which our cities sit. And I think that's one of the single largest problems of Mr. Pundey, all hold, hold your thought there. I think it's a really important one which Amit Bhatt also spoke about. So let's get both the developers here in, into the game. Flattening of the land, not understanding the you know attributes of really the land that we are building on, just building for houses and for nothing else. Uh, Shailesh, is, is that really happening? I mean, you guys go with plans and there are municipal bodies which give you an approval. There are There is zoning that, okay, fine, this is the place where you can be built. Land is auctioned there. So so why are we ignoring this and, and are developers not aware of that? So I'll talk about Bharatiya city that we are building in Bangalore, 20 million square feet. We took four years, Mr. Punde, to design the whole thing, and we took the entire gradient slopes. So we are actually not losing the slope, we are creating water bodies inside to build a walk-to-work, walk-to-school environment. But I do agree with what you said about water bodies being lost. In fact, in, in Chennai, in 2000, somebody told me that the kind of planning that Chennai had, Chennai could never get flooded. And actually, she was right, because... It's only the, the subsequent 2000 onwards development which actually got flooded. So we must keep sight of that. And as I said earlier, this is the time to safeguard our water bodies, our water channels. Although sometimes you can go on the other extreme. The National Green Tribunal order on Raj Kalevas in Bangalore, I hope are not affecting you, uh, Mr. Sharma. Mr. Sharma, that's another no, big no. thing. I mean, bungalows are getting raised and those pictures are quite, very horrific. I, and, and I do know the developers in Bangalore are living under continuous, uns, you know, like a democracy sword, it hangs over you. So, so there is somebody who must have given permission to build in those areas, those bungalows, those buildings, those projects have come up. In some cases, individual cases, there have been violations of the permits, but in most cases, People are crying foul and they're saying, look, we were allowed to build here, we had the permission. So what's going on there as well? I, I do agree with Manisha, right? Today, it is, we are developers, we are builders. And when we see uh, something happening like demolitions, uh, right, we also feel sad and sorry. And for this state of affairs, sometimes I am not... Uh, wearing the hat of a developer, as a human being also, we feel sad and sorry, correct? We do realize that uh, there needs to be road, there needs to be, right, no illegal constructions, but uh, we are giving a right to live to even the slum dwellers. We are giving a right for rehabilitation of the slum dwellers also. 
So at the end of the day, we are living in a human society, and I think good sense will prevail. Somewhere all of us are responsible as well. But at the same time, we need to look at tomorrow. India appears to be the only bright spot. So many challenges we have been able to overcome. This can be challenge. This kind of a challenge also can be overcome. There are experts who can design it well. There are people who can execute it well. We need to invest sufficiently. We need to have good intentions. And I personally believe that developers, as far as Bangalore developers are concerned, more responsible, more accountable, prepared to invest uh, whatever Absolutely. is required from yeah. their side mm. to ensure that we can bring back uh, uh, the Bangalore to its uh, old glory. Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. I buy that point that they're definitely more responsible. Amit Bhatt, though, I mean, this flattening of uh, developable, developable land, as you talk about, and land itself being a scarce resource in the cities. But I went went back to a UN report, and it, it you know, debunked this whole land being scarce. If you look at Bangalore, it's, it's actually growing outwards. If you look at New Delhi, it's really not added much to its population. It's really Gurgaon which is added. It's, it's growing outside. So, Land stops being actually a scarce commodity if you're able to allow it to expand in the right way. So, so uh, how do you see this whole mess in Gurgaon or let's say the IT parts or, or you know, electronic city in Bangalore? Asak, this is a very interesting question. So, I mean, if you look at a global level, cities today only occupy 2% of planet's area, only 2%. They produce 70% of the wealth, which is GDP. So, which is good. But on the other side, which is slightly worrying, is that they also produce 70% of the waste and 60% of the global greenhouse ah, gases. Okay. So, so, what, so what WRI was involved in this global commission, and we were trying to address two, one fundamental question. Can urban development or can city development and environment coexist, or it is one versus the other? Mm -hmm. And after a global data search and, and introspection with global experts, we found they can coexist. And we have examples. So, for example, if you take Barcelona on one side and Atlanta on the other side, mm -hmm. these are the cities which have same amount of economy, same amount of population, but the externalities are different. So, for example, the area under Atlanta is 10 times that of Barcelona. So, the emissions are higher, the road traffic fatalities are higher, and there's a lot of, un, uh, you know, externality. So the point I'm trying to make is land. So if we want to develop in a manner which is sustainable, we have to do one, we have to adopt one fundamental approach, mm -hmm. which is we have to have compact, connected, and coordinated development, which means unlimited expansion of urban areas will only create much bigger externalities. Ah. And therefore, what the government needs to do is to set up a planning framework. So what we are missing in, in, in this debate is that there are planning functions and there are execution functions. Right. And we mix both these things, right? So the government has to plan in the right manner, and the developers like Mr. Sharma and others, or Shailesh is there, who's a good friend, they can come and execute to the best of the capacity. Okay. But if you, if you mix these two functions, then there's a problem. There is a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, Mr. Pune wanted to come in. I know that he's been, he has a point to make, but Mr. Pune, what's your response uh, to what Amit Bhatt has said, that we mix planning and execution, and that's perhaps uh, the crux of the problem? Well, I, uh, I'm quite clear that there is strategically, uh, or in the, in the longer run, you will have to understand that you will have to account for a, a, a landscape infrastructure for a city which actually behaves like a resilience infrastructure. Uh, I was just going to, the, the reason why I wanted to get in was this whole thing that's happening right now in Bangalore. You see, it, it is very important that we keep our waterways clear. But how do we keep them clear without a study and arbitrary decisions kind of moving up and down or shifting those boundary edges Perfect. on an arbitrary basis is, is actually the problem. If, if, if the state wants to implement these, uh, the, the more important issue actually is the level of water than actually the physical planned space. And I can give you one very classic example of, uh, I mean, I can only speak from my professional experience, that uh, take, for example, a tsunami warnings. They say all uh, settlements at 500 meters from the sea, please go move backwards, right, or move behind. 
actually there are locations which are very safe right on the uh, on the sea front which would be 5 me 500 meters above okay. which doesn't need to go behind but there would be something which is 2 kilometers deep which actually also needs to move out right because that's the question of the terrain and if you don't understand the terrain and make your norms you are in trouble okay so that does bring us back to the planning uh, point. Okay, very quickly, gentlemen, we've got just 10 minutes on the debate left, and I think I really wanted to touch upon that. Who's responsible for the city part of it? Mayor. Now, there are cities which have mayors, there are cities which don't have mayors, there are cities which have mayor tenure of one year, there are cities which have mayor tenures of two years. So, so if you look at some of the most robust cities, and a lot of times, I think, Shailesh, we keep taking the example of New York and some of the biggest cities which are well managed. Talk about a mayor. Tell me, how do you bring that system in place in India and, and allow the chief minister to give away powers to a mayor? Um, I think sensible uh, and smart chief ministers in India are already realizing that there's an urban vote out there. Mm -hmm. And if they don't handle their cities well, the urban vote is going to gravitate away from them. So even and even if that vote is a small amount or small in number, it's a very influ big influence. It's, it's a very influential it's a vote. It's a big right? influence. So okay. just, just see the kind of uh, outrage there was in Gurgaon and Bengaluru's. Uh, so intelligent chief ministers are hopefully going to realize that good city governance is going to further their party's prospects. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is this new party waiting to take and grab that vote. Ah. Absolutely. And it's it's there for the taking. If Chief Minister, sir or madam, if you don't manage your city properly, there is a vacuum with somebody is coming to uh, move into. Uh, just one point on, I don't agree with this, uh, uh, this you know, uh, planning and execution thing. Uh, I think cities need to grow vertically and we have this corruption element in granting extra FSI. Now just to give you a small example, in Bangalore we are happy to do a nearly 3.75 for FAR, over 130 acres integrated township, live, work, play. Had we wanted to do the same thing in Gurgaon, we would have required more than 600 acres because of weird rules that are there in Gurgaon. So maybe we, we need to learn from best practices. Cities need to go vertical, they need to be densification and there's uh, a lot of uh, transit oriented development that's being talked about but this cannot happen with chief ministers this will happen with mayors all right amit bhat i'm going to come back to the mayor point i think some ways shalish said has come back to the point that yes what you said it has to be coordinated and it has to be comprehensive on a mayor what are your thoughts i mean what should a mayor be doing what should he be responsible for and what should the tenure be should he be elected should he be appointed what should the framework of a mayor actually be to make him effective no exactly and so i think Salis is absolutely right so for example if you look at even the gurgaon case study so when this rain happened and the city was locked or gridlocked who was responsible mm. right so people went to the urban development the huda uh, then they went to municipal corporation, then they went to mayor. So we still don't know who is the Absolutely. actually first citizen of the city. So that's one. Hmm. And if you, I mean, leave the examples of New York, right? Because they are a developed uh, country and all, uh, nation, uh, a city. But even cities like Bogota, which are, which are from Colombia and have shown huge transformation in the last one decade, have shown because of the visionary mayors uh, who have run the city. So. One is that we need to create and empower mayors. That is one. But and, and I think it will take time. So what? So the question to us is that what can we do in between? And can we learn some of these best practices from India itself? Mm -hmm. And a great example is Surat, right? Which was once a plaque city and all kinds of things. Is now has Surat really transformed in the last decade and a half. And that happened because we had empowered commissioners who had a slightly longer tenure who were there for three, four years. So maybe a municipal cadre and, and a fixed tenure of municipal commissioners or corporations owning the agency could be something which can be thought of as an intermittent level. But if you really want to kind of look at a larger frame, then mayors have to come in and they have to be empowered and the powers have to be delegated. There are no questions about it. Cannot municipal commissioners be empowered? I, oh, I mean, I much. just wanted to ask that question. I, uh, Mr. Punde, go ahead. Yeah, I don't think it is so much about, I don't think it's so much about power 
or how uh, i mean if there is indeed an issue about accountability okay let's uh, not talk about uh, i made, when i said empowered i just meant who's accountable right now when gurgaon is a mess it's literally a blame game yeah it is it is becoming a blame blame game and i i agree with the point that there has to be a centralized agency that has to finally be responsible for the city but the examples that were given just now about bogota or many of the latin american countries are basically the, the those examples have been successful not because there was centralized power or there was authority with the mayor as much or rather at least equally the fact that they were conscious technical people mm. the mayor of bogota was an architect who understood the sensitivity that you need to deal with uh, you know when you deal with the city so uh, to me the issue about consciousness and knowledge and therefore it leads to the issue of capacity uh, finally to uh, you know be okay, able to so address this problem expertise i would say no matter how much power you may give to any single uh, agency i don't think it's going to make that much of a difference till you kind of raise the overall okay. knowledge Mr. level consciousness mr punde i i i would i myself find that very hard to believe i mean you really don't have to go I, through I, a presidential I, I, I school to rule the country well you can hire the right people and get it together so this might be one example that you have an architect can I, can as I a mayor okay example okay go ahead amit so when i was speaking the the case of uh, enrique penelosa and and bogota so when he got elected the first thing he did was that he said look i cannot transform the city because i don't know the city context so in fact he hired 15 20 bright urban planners transport planners mm. financial experts yes, and created yeah. a team which led this transformation let right? me give an indian example but since he is the nodal person he is empowered at the city level he people look up to him and he is accountable to them he did this So, okay. so that okay. is the great case study. Which let me let know. me get Mr. Sharma in. Uh, we do need to get his opinion, Mr. Sharma. What would you like uh, if if Bangalore had an empowered mayor? Uh, do you think that the city could be way better than what it is today? I mean, have you lobbied for it? You're a powerful group in Bangalore, by uh, the way. See, see, nobody should disagree that there should be a face, and he should have a longer tenure. Mm -hmm. but what we should be deliberating and debating is that whether there is a required will power in the person a b at the same time whether the government today whether it belongs to x party or y party or z party because in most of the states the governments keep changing but the people have the same kind of problems so what we need to look at is that a right kind of person for the city requirements whether he should be an architect or whether he should be a bureaucrat is immaterial uh, he needs to have a will power a and number 2 with the government of the day it should start looking at city as one of the most focused area and whatever issues today you have raised they are, are most important for our country's future for our economic future for our growth needs to be looked at from that perspective as well so bangalore's infrastructure not only the rain the transport issue which is on a day to day basis becoming worsening needs to be tackled in a holistic manner bangalore's okay. development also needs to be looked into in a holistic manner and it needs very correctly as we are talking about lot of planning and lot of investment in execution also and while executing we need not have to shortcut undercut or huge influence uh, for getting things done all right if we start following the simple rules i think things will start changing but i think if you were to look at immediate solutions i think some of those which which were set of governance is extremely important and who's responsible and then to actually plan out a city based on the topography of that city and the natural topography not not you know uh, Okay Mr Sharma go ahead sir <laughs> these are my takeaways i was going to wrap out but i think you still have a point would, to make i would just like to wait for the urban Manisha, renaissance more, conference yes go ahead sir manisha one more thing uh, mm -hmm. the, the citizens also they need to be also uh, right accountable and responsible Absolutely. whether it is traffic Absolutely. management whether it is say for example fire management in bangalore the fire department and developers are making best efforts to train right but they are not willing to get trained we invest crores and crores but they are not willing to get themselves trained what would we do with those equipments if they are not willing to get trained
we need to also make our citizens equally responsible and you are talking about a city where citizens are actually considered to be one of the most proactive nationally go finally uh, you know Shailesh, you made a point of that big conference coming up. The fact that uh, the current government has recognized the problem that you need to fix the cities. What are your expectations from it? Um, number one, uh, I'm told that there are five pillars. Number one, we're talking about an empowered mayor with a five-year direct elected term. Mm -hmm. um, I hope they do something to remove the rotation in mayors. Okay. Which is why we don't come across too many two-time mayors. I hope they do something about building capacity in municipal corporations and building centers of excellence in each major city. We can't just have one National Institute of Urban Affairs in Delhi. Mm -hmm. We need 25 NIUA counterparts across the city. And above all, actually we need to reduce corruption in city management because cities are perceived as ATM machines for mm. taking out cash and spending elsewhere in the state. I think it's high time. We uh, stop that. We stop that. All right, talking about uh, Institute of Urban Affairs, well, we do have the gentleman at the helm of affairs there coming up right after the break. But Mr. Sharma, Amit Pat, Ravindra Pundey, and Shailesh Patak, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. This topic's not going to die down in a hurry, and we hope to see you back in the studio because we'll keep the issue alive. And as I said, Professor Jagan Shah joins us right after this break. He is Director of National Institute of Urban Affairs, literally the nodal and the sole agency right now responsible for all India cities. He'll join us with his points of view on India's urban decline and how best can we fix it. So we'll be back with that on the show. Stay with us on The Real Debate.